Okay, guys, we have Dave here this week, and he's joining us talking about Chult. Hello. Which is uh, jungle wilderness in the middle of uh, the South Seas of Faerun. And um, we've recently had this big discussion going on in this little Facebook chat between us and a few others um, who have been on the podcast in various other forms. Um, Camping to glamping. Which camping is best? That is my question. So... Dave, we're relying heavily on your expertise here, but all three of us were Boy Scouts growing up, right? Yeah. So we, we've got some insights here. So let's roll the dice and see. I got a 14. Uh, you're a 9. I'm an 8. Okay. Okay. Um, I am a 9. Packing your stuff in, bringing some food with you, um, maybe bringing some like water sandy tabs or whatever the fuck else you need to do it's been a few years since i've gone because i have kids and i haven't been able to go yeah. legit hike in the middle of the woods somewhere and set up just in the wilderness that is my ideal form not necessarily going in with a knife and a bit of string yeah this isn't that novel hatchet right yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, like i i want to come prepared but i, I want to go into the wilderness yeah, that, that's that's my ideal. Yeah, no, look, I'm the same way. I don't want a campground. I don't want it. I don't want other people around. I don't need running water or a toilet. I will dig a hole and and. But I also want to bring a cooler. I want to eat steak. I want to drink beer. Yeah, right. And I want to. It's not. It's not quite leave no trace, but definitely within a month, there's no real sign besides a couple of trees missing that I was ever there. Right. So that's that's my answer. That is my level of comfort where I can drive in to just the wilderness somewhere. Yeah. I can drive in and live to set up the tent near my car and have the cooler in the back of the car and I just live my life. So we we did something like this for my bachelor party and I think it was fan fucking tastic. I woke up in a river. You woke up in a river. You I would you almost didn't wake up. <laughs> I almost river. choked and died on steak and got shot in the face by my brother. But yeah, with a gun. With we, a gun. You're not making that shit up. Yeah. They, it was an airsoft gun. It was two days before my wedding and I got shot in the eye with an airsoft gun. Anyway, Dave. She, she still married you. <laughs> Obviously, it's not about the looks for you, Dave. Obviously. It never was. <laughs> Obviously. It never was. Dave, what about you? Um, I like the idea of having a base camp and then getting out into doing other things. Uh, so I like a little bit of comfort. I think I have proven myself over and over that I can light a fire in the pouring rain. Uh, I can make shelter out of anything wherever I am. I can do this stuff. It doesn't mean that I like to or that I have to, okay? <laughs> I have a bad knee, all right? I've had knee surgery. They intentionally broke the bottom of my femur. My knee hurts all the time, okay? I am not okay with going to pop a squat in the woods anymore. I want a toilet. Okay, <laughs> that's important to me now. All right, I can do it, you but I don't just get want a, to. You can't just get a conveniently shaped like felled tree or something. I could, but I don't want to. All right? <laughs> what you need to do is hollow out a tree stump and put a toilet seat on top of it. Oh yeah, sure, fine. But like, I'm over the days of just like heading out with a knife and a pack of matches. I can do that. I have proven myself. I don't need to do it again. Give me somewhere where I can be warm, I can be happy, and I don't need fancy steaks or anything. Part of the fun is eating those cans of beans around the fire and stinking up the shelter with your buddies, making fart jokes and telling him he smells like a piece of shit. Because really, he smells, he smells like, like a piece, piece of shit. shit. Yeah. Right. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, in my defense, though, I want steak a couple of times. I'm not relying on that. This is about, like, marshmallows and hot dogs over the camp. There, there's, right. something, there's something fantastic about lake water tortellini. I don't know what it is. You're not but, like, wrong. there's a special spot in my heart for that. But I yeah. also like the idea of going out, catching a fish, all right, and gutting it, putting a stick through it, and then cooking that on a fire. Like, that that's my wilderness steak right there. That's nice to me. I don't think I've ever done that. Let's go camping, Dan. Yes, please. Thank God. You're not invited. <laughs> yes, please. Thank God. <laughs> Welcome to the It's a Mimic podcast with your DMs, Adam, Dan, and Dave. Welcome to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast, the roundtable Dungeons and Dragons discussion where you never know what you're going to get. I'm Dan and with me are Dave and Adam and today we're talking about the land of Chult. Chult sounds like a dirty word. Kind of does. It also sounds like a body part that goes under the shorts. Chult? I hit him right in the chult? Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, right in the chult. 
Gross. Gross. Anyways, so uh, Chult is a uh, wild jungle island. It's very reminiscent of like the land of the lost. So if you like big dinosaurs, big bugs, big plants, big freaking big waterfalls, big landscapes, you go to Chult. Um, if you're aiming to have a pulp old style, like we're talking 1920s style adventure game that echoes like Tomb Raider or Indiana Jones. We talk a lot about this kind of stuff in the Eberron podcast as well, because that's the other place yeah. where you find this stuff. Um, Just this one's in the Forgotten Realms. Yeah, this one, the Chult is built into the Forgotten Realms, but they made it fairly easy to transplant. I mean, if, if I was to do a uh, Tomb of Annihilation, which is where you find Chult. The book uh, Tomb of Annihilation features Chult heavily. Um, if I was to do that, but I wanted to do it in Eberron, I would just change Chult to Zendrix. Zendrix has its own unique flavor. There's a lot of like... Oh, I put it in an island off of Zendrix, but Zendrix is a jungle as well. It can be. Yeah, uh, yes. Y you are right. I would do that. That is a way that I would flavor Zendrick. If yeah. I wanted to run Tomb of uh, Annihilation in an Eberron campaign, like we're just going to take five months out and run this module, I would put it over by Zendrick. Yeah. I, I mean, I honestly wouldn't. I and mean, without giving away too much, I mean, there's a lot of different races that you don't find in other places in Schult, right? Um, yes. Okay, yeah. so so in that manner, I think it would almost fit more with, like, Kabara. Yeah, you could do it in Kabar, except that Chalt is supposed to be an island. Well, it was but, an island in past lore. It is now a peninsula oh, oh, um, shit, there you connected go. off off the thing. After after the spell plague hit, a lot of the water uh, rescinded, and there's now a connection to the neighboring continent. Sure, I, I but, like it off Kabar because of the dinosaur connection as well, and the Talenta Plains are nearby. Yeah, and, but and, yes, and yes. like it, it was uh, solitary from the rest of Corvair. It had the the, the mountain range that blocked it off and. It's only recently been discovered and brought into the the nations of Corvair. Like, it's... it's eh. yeah, yeah, but Chalt has its own unique, different flavor that's not just ancient, fallen, giant civilizations and now crazy other... Um, like, the drow are there and only there um, in yeah. Zendrick, in Eberron. So, Chalt has its own unique flavor. It has its own unique flavor. Um, it, it's, it's very tribal. Um, it's very, like... South Pacific, like if if I was wanting to play a Samoan analog, he'd probably be from the Chult area. It's got this tropical feel, um, and and it it really fits well, man. Like if if you are wanting to play something like uh, that you see in Up or those old Flash Gordon shows or uh, the early episodes of Doctor Who, where you just have big fucking ferns everywhere and dinosaurs roaming the land, this is where this is where you would play it. So. Um, in the interest of making sure that we are not too spoilery with the Tomb of Annihilation, this, this episode is pretty much just going to be a survey of the land of Chult. We are going to mainly try to avoid a lot of the story beats that Tomb of Annihilation pulls out, but, um, some of these areas we do need to talk about. Now, um, again, this is also an hour and a half to two hour long podcast. We're not covering absolutely everything. Um, we're just going to do the best we can. So off we go. Um, we want to start off first. We're going to do some of the locations now for the ease of use. I have determined that the, uh, or ease of kind of giving you guys the information. I've, I've broken it up into three sections. Um, the civilizations, the spot that is, uh, where civilization has made a home in these wildlands, um, the geographical locations, these are uh, weird geographical anomalies other than mountains and waterfalls and vast jungle. There's going to be some weird geograph uh, geographical things here. And then finally, the ruins, because uh, Chaltz was once a massive kingdom. Um, and of course, when kingdoms leave, they leave behind ruins. So we're going to be talking about those and the fun things you could do there. So right off the bat, we are going to cover our civilizations. These are uh, the civilized lands, the few bright spots on the island. And most notable that I'm going to be covering here are Port Nianzaru, which is your main port of entry into the land. Fort Bellurian, Bellurian, hard to say that. Kersabal, Rackhammer, and the Jaka Anchorage. So I'm just going to be covering those quick five cities that you could uh, go to. 
Okay. I've never heard any of these freaking words before, so okay. you're just speaking gibberish. Port Nianzaru is going to be your main port of call in Chult. It is your main home. Can you say it slower? Because you're just you're blowing through and I don't understand what you're saying. Port Nianzaru. Is Nianzaru the name of the port? Yes. That's not all one word? It's not all one word. Okay. It is Port Nianzaru. Okay, I thought you were saying Portney and Zaru. Oh, no, no. Okay, it's right. Port Nianzaru. Okay, check the show notes for spellings. Yes. I mean, it's D&D. The spelling's going to be weird. Anyways, Port Nianzaru was established by Am as a port of call for uh, trade lines. Am is one of those big co- uh, country states that is present in the Forgotten Realms. Um, and it's got so much cool things to do in it. There's gladiatorial arena. There's, um, it's got very heavy naval and tribal themes put in. It's kind of like an Egyptian bazaar met like Morocco. Is there a, a, spe- a specific, um, race that is like the dominant? humans? It's mostly humans. Uh, Chulton humans are the main race here, but it's, it's a bit of a melting pot. They're like, it is a main port city on the main, uh, trade lines for all of the Sword Coast. So it's it's got a bit of a melting pot feel to it. A lot of people come in and out, may, very multicultural. But I think the the big thing that's even going to draw the attention of your most murdery hobo, there's dinosaur races in the streets of Port Nianzaru. Cool. In the streets. So yeah. are we talking Fast and the Furious? Or are we talking like, like Morocco Formula One? Uh, yeah. Both? That's Monaco. Is it? Oops. I don't care about Formula <laughs> One. I want you to know that turning left is not a sport. That's NASCAR. Well, okay. I also don't care that the turning left and then right is not a sport. He I'm, needs to watch the Isle of Man races. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they make you clench from YouTube. Yeah, most people... There is normally about a death a year on the Isle of Man races. That sounds like a horrible thing. Until yeah. you watch it, and then you're just like, yeah, go faster. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyways, so um, Port Nianzaru is, of course, going to be your central location that you base everything out of for the campaign. Um, and I don't want to get into too many details, because when it comes into Port Nianzaru, it's fairly central location-ish. I know, I've said it four different ways. I apologize. Uh, next on the list is for Bellurian. Uh, which is the home of the Flaming Fist organization. Okay. <clears throat> what? Fort Bellurian. Bellurian? Yeah. Okay, and it's a Flaming Fist? Uh, home of the Flaming Fist Company, which is a militia that came here after their leader got a little bit expedition-y. So he brought his entire company over, established, established the fort, and then went on an expedition died so they named the fort after him and then uh Baldur's Gate basically bought this and now it's a Baldur's Gate outpost on the island of Chult. Flaming Fist was I think that was the name of the of the kid uh in Deadpool 2. Wasn't it Russell? Yeah, but like his X-Men name was Flaming Fist, I think. Something like that. I'm not kidding because they made a whole bunch of like horrible sex. It's Deadpool too. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah, like, that's all I can think of right now is just a bunch of that kid walking around. Yeah. Um, I I, I don't want to uh, give any illusions though. Uh, Fort Billurian is in itself its own in its own right a very large um, town. It's got a population of about a thousand people. Is this on the coast too, or is it, it is also on the coast? It's in the bay. Of, it's just off to the Bay of Chult. Okay. Uh, which, how, how big is the island of Chalt? I don't. I don't really have an idea. It's massive. Um, Can you give us a like? Are we talking? Are we talking mm-hmm. Vancouver Island, Great Britain, North Australia? to South? It's bigger than the Sword Coast, right? Uh, north to South, it's about the same size as the Sword Coast Holy is. Shit. Um, and east to west, it's probably about the size I would guess of Texas. My God, this is the, so you're talking a Canadian province. This is about a Canadian province size worth Jesus. of land. If you have the map of Chult and you see the grids, each hex is a day's worth of travel by horse. By horse, and I'm assuming that's on a road too. Like, oh, there are no roads. Okay, so all right. Okay, no, that's 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 big. That's... It's 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 fucking massive, which is one of the reasons why this is the campaign. If you want to go on an expedition. 
you go to Tomb of Annihilation, you go to Chult. Okay. Um, next, and this is just a really cool one, is uh, Curse Sabal. Curse Sabal is on the eastern side uh, near the Sky Lizard Mountains. It is a purely Aarakocran monastery. It is one of the very, very uh, only places close to the Wildlands that offers respite for adventurers and is generally welcoming and good aligned. There's just one problem. It's for Aarakocrans by Aarakocrans. So you've got to figure out how to fly up to it because there ain't no stairs. And it's built on the side of a cliff. Cool. Like we're talking hundreds and hundreds of feet Hundreds up. upon hundreds of feet up. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, the poor Kenku just has <laughs> such envy standing at the bottom of the cliff. <laughs> yeah. Um, next, uh, we are going to go from the flying highs to the deep lows and go to Harakhamar, which is in the... Again, Harakhamar? H-R-A-K. Harak. Harak. H-A-M-A-R. Harakhamar. Yeah. Rackhammer? Rackhammer. Yeah. Harakhamar. Uh, okay, guys. Pop quiz. Yeah. What kind of creature lives in Hrakhamar? Hrakhamar. Note, it's a cave. Uh, a cave troll. No, dwarves. It, it, it is full of albino dwarves who have lived in these soot and ash-covered caves for so long that their skin is white. Cool. They are. What color is their beards? Ash-white dwarves. What color are their beards? White. They're like, completely albino. Completely though. albino. Red, red eyes. Red eyes, everything. Cool. Um, however, in uh, the Tomb of Annihilation story, uh, they don't necessarily live there and want you to uh, liberate it from invading forces. So uh, there is also a, a guide that you could get that is from there. That's whole mission is to free Harakamar so the people can go back. The big claim to fame her in Harakamar is the massive adamantine mines. There are massive mother loads of adamantine just under the mountain in Harakamar. And if you are to free them, you have access to a endless fortune of adamantine. I mean, you got to fight through fire newts and fire elementals and dragons to get to yeah. it. But Adamantine is, is one of those things that I've got a real love-hate relationship with in D&D. Because it doesn't make a fuck ton of sense to me. Um... I have this problem with any fake metal, though. Everything yeah. from unobtainium through to... Unobtainium, I have special to, but, issue with. But vibranium, um, like adamantium from the Marvel comics. The, like, anytime there's, there's anything like that, I've got an issue with it. Yeah. So, I don't... I, like, we couldn't have just said platinum. We couldn't have just said iron. Like, it couldn't... It couldn't just be a magical iron. No, it's got to be a special, super hard... Extra. We couldn't just call it elven steel. Like, fuck. I don't know. I'm just... I'm I'm ranting. No, let's, let's, let's get back to our fucking Chicago dwarves. <laughs> uh, Sh Chicago. <laughs> she Shish kebab. <laughs> We're actually going to move on, and we... you know that movie only has a 31 percent in Rotten Tomatoes. Which movie? Ace Ventura Two. That's when nature. Calls. That's a fucking crime. I know that that thing is a staple of my childhood. <laughs> yeah, you could tell. <laughs> um, the final place you can't have a tropical paradise without pirates. Um, and of course, Chultz has its own little home for pirates in Jahaka Anchorage. Uh, Jahaka Anchorage is, of course, a little bay off the side of the island um, where not a lot of people could get access to. Is this a bay that's close to the Sword Coast or on the far side of the island? It's on the side that is close to the Sword Coast. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's it's a town of piracy, but again, it's very open to visitors. As long as you have the coin. Um, but, I mean, I would recommend keeping a close eye on your belongings, even if you're there. Because, hey, it's still a pirate town. Is is this, like, the equivalency of... What what was the Pirates of the Caribbean um, Yes. Town? Tortuga? Tortuga, thank yes. you. Yes. It, it, it's very, very closely tied with that. Okay. Right? And you have to, like, pass these massive stone pillars to get into it if you're coming by the water. So, so we'll now quickly cover some of the key features uh, that make Chult stand out in the unexplored jungle island paradise with bugs the size of trucks that will kill you on sight. No, yeah, wild dinosaurs crap. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest features of the geography of Chult's not including the fucking jungle, because the jungle's everywhere and pervasive, um, is the Aldani Basin. It's a hot spring and wetlands, 
where a hidden uh, race of lobstermen live. Is this the Chul? No, no. They're intelligent lobstermen. What, okay, what are they called? The Aldani. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, they are basically this hidden race who once, it is rumored, ruled the entire island with an iron... Uh, claw. 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 Yeah. 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 That was one of the jokes I wrote down. <laughs> Goddamn, Dan. <laughs> but, uh... Thank you, Dave. <laughs> uh, next, floating over top of the Aldani Basin is the heart of Uptau. Um, It is a massive chunk of rock that is oddly heart-shaped and leaks red fluid. Uptau? Uptau. U-B-T-A-U. A-O. A-O. Is he a god? He is. I, he how is do, one I, of how the, do I know that? He is one of the ancient gods of Chult, and I'll be covering not them by name later, but... but I'll be covering some of them later, for sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, but this floating, heart-shaped piece of land floats over top of the Aldani Basin. It is seen from a distance. It floats above the jungle. It leaks red uh, fluid from it. It's got uh, a singular tree that looks like an artery coming off the top. Um, and it moves throughout the entirety of uh, the Aldani Basin, and sometimes just straight up disappears. I know why I know it. It's because it's pronounced Upteo, and I heard about it on another fucking thing, like, years ago. Because <laughs> that was so cool, there's a god of dinosaurs, and that's what he is. Yeah. He's the god of dinosaurs. So yes. that that's, yeah. Yeah. Um, next is the Firefinger, not Dave. Even, no, not even touching it. No? no. Adam? No. Well, the Firefinger is it's, that's, a... It's part of the Burning Fist people, right? Flaming Fist. Flaming, Flaming Fist. Fist, right. No, yeah. this this was it from... It burns the, afterwards when they're done. This is from the civilization that's long you have before. on you. Fuck it, Adam. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Firefinger is a uh, the last surviving beacon from the ancient Chilton Empire. It is a 200-foot tall uh, limestone tower with a beacon up top. It's like a lighthouse. So it's like a big lighthouse. Um, think like the lights of uh, Rohan. Sure. Okay. Right. Those the, those kinds. Of is things. it lit all of the time? Uh, no. In fact, it is uh, the Firefinger's home to a race of Terra folk. Do you mean Terra folk? Terra folk. Yes, that's uh, what I said. Like, like pterodactyl people. People. Yeah. Okay, so like lizard folk with wings. So like lizard folk with wings like and pterodactyl heads. Like Sauron from the X-Men. Okay. Yes, yes, very much, yes. Um, and with the same kind of attitude. They are violent, aggressive, flying creatures. And if they see you coming, they will come pick you up, fly you up to the top of the fire finger and drop you. I think they're large size too, if I remember correctly. Like they're big. Yes, yeah, they're, yeah. they're fairly large. Um, and for every one of your adventuring party they see... Two of them will come to fight you. And they could hit you at any point in time in the jungle. Now I want to know what their CR is and see how fucking scary they I think it's is. CR4. The scary enough. Yeah. That is scary enough. Maybe CR2, but still. Well, especially right? if there's, you know, a party of five, there's ten of them. Like, that's... That's that's a that's, that's what rough. a CR16 encounter. It doesn't actually stack up all the way to 20, but... Yeah. So, um... Next is the Land of Ash and Smoke, which is a large area to the south of the Aldani Basin. In traditional uh, badass D&D tone, dragons and fire elementals and fire newts and salamanders, uh, and I'm not talking about the little gecko ones, come here to rest in the heat and bathe in the smoke and steam. A massive mine called the Wormheart Mine is nestled somewhere within and is said to contain untold riches as long as you could get by the dragons and elementals and salamanders and fire newts and sounds easy it's funny you know i was thinking that this is one of the one places that or chult would be one of the one um areas in fifth edition where fire would really help you because i mean even out of the abyss with all the demon shit that goes on and avernus if you're taking fire spells you're just fucking useless yeah right like the fifth ed laughs at you in avernus with your fire spells so i would assume that that chult would be a place where you can really let loose with it but apparently not. Fire newts and salamanders and shit. I would like to point out, I've played an entire campaign on Chult twice and have never gone to the Land of Ashes Smoke. Hmm. It is... Oh, uh, Terra Folk, by the way, are CR1. But still, I mean, a group of five, that's a CR8 encounter. Yeah. Give or take, right? As for a medium encounter, so... Yeah, no, they're, 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 they're pretty terrifying. I get it. I get it. 
Paterifying? Paterifying. It was, that was terrifying, but with P. <laughs> Has that a little bit of P came out? A little bit. Okay. Uh, the next little... Gra- uh, <laughs> fuck. The next uh, geographical location I want to cover real quick is the Cauldron, which is next to the Land of Fire and Smoke, but I wanted... Or Land of Ash and Smoke, but I wanted to draw uh, attention to it because it is the section of the island that... Or the ocean around the island that boils... It is acidic water, and uh, to put your hand in it is to have the flesh slough off the bone. Okay, and I'm assuming that this will, like, eat away at your wooden boats and stuff, too? Yes. Yeah. I've seen Dante's Peak. All you need is a grandmother. You'll be fine. Oh. Oh. No? No? Too dark? So I was watching a show the other day. Sorry, tangent for a minute. Yep. So I was watching a show the other day, and there was a character on it, and I was all like, who the hell is that guy? I know exactly who it is. That's the coffee, 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 Boca, Java, yeah, from Cappuccino. Yeah. So, like, I pulled that out. That movie came out 23 years ago. Oh, I know. Uh, did you know that that was the first movie that I saw in theaters with my friends? February 7th, 1997. You know the date. Yeah. Yeah, it was the first time that I was allowed to go out by myself with friends without parental accompaniment to go see like a movie that wasn't some kids. I think I saw Dennis the Menace like that too. That was a cat, yeah. right? That was the first quote unquote grown up movie because it was rated, you know, PG thirteen. Uh and so like it was it was a big deal for me. And it had to hold a special place in my heart and I went back to watch it again not long ago. And oh no, oh no. It does not hold up. My Mr. Friend. Mr. Brosnan, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> Please, please go back to James Bond. And I don't say that lightly. <laughs> um, so we're we're done covering the geographical places. I just want to cover the ruins real quick. There is the town of M- M- Mbala. Mbala. M-B-L- M-B-A-L-A. They got one of those in freaking Eberron too. They've got a... Um, the Dwarven place? No, no, no. The, the plane of M- uh, Mabar. 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 Yeah, but it's M apostrophe. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's also the Roar Holds as well, uh, the, which is M R O R. Roar Holds. Roar. <laughs> Roar Holds. I like uh, that they give us words like this occasionally, but also, what the fuck, guys? Give us a pronunciation <laughs> list because this shit is crazy. Um, so, Mbalo was once a rich and prosperous town on a plateau, uh, but is now a uh, ghost town littered with skulls that show the sign of cannibalism, maybe? So like tooth marks. Yep. Cool. Yep. Um, the it is avoided by all at sorry it is avoided at all costs by locals and rumors of its one malevolent occupant are the tales Chilton parents tell their children to keep them in line. Who's the occupant? Nanny Poo Poo. Legit. Legit. Is, Nanny Poo Poo. I do not believe that you are pronouncing that correctly. I am looking that up because that seems like a thing that your fucking Friday group mispronounces because that's all they do is mispronounce to to b- p u apostrophe p u. How do you pronounce that, Adam? Papa. I'm looking it up. Pew pew. <laughs> <laughs> Pronounced uh, poo poo. I'm not joking. That's it's nanny poo poo. Sure. I'm going with pew pew and finger guns. Get nanny finger guns. Nanny finger guns. Yep. Next is Mesro, which was the gem of the Cholton Empire. The town of Mesro is now a looted rubble strewn about the jungle. Many creatures and undead call it home. I should mention the island of Cholt is littered with undead. Um, but that is very Tomb of Annihilation connected as well for the reason why. Um, the, this great metropolis was once rumored to be inhabited by mor- immortals. Okay. And they... Well, guess what? I mean, if they're not there, then... But there's no even... Re- there are no remains to them, either. They just left. The, the, this gone. is a Roanoke scenario. They it's, just it's kind of a, one day. It is kind of a Roanoke situation, yes. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I like that. Um, next is uh, Dungrungalung. I regret asking you <laughs> to cover this episode. Yeah, I knew you would. This is why I brought this up. Dungrungalung is the Grung capital inside of uh, Chult. Um, I, I didn't really know where else to put it because it's not really a ruin. But uh, it's got this key feature that I needed to say, which is they have built a 200 foot tall mud statue of a frog in the hopes to get their king laid by the frog god and make a bunch of frog god babies. Yeah, you're not wrong. It's Dungrunglung. Good lord. Yep. Um, there's also a Taz. Ha ha ha! I'm sorry. 
You're just making loud noises to a microphone. No, no. that it, You need I, to slow down and pronounce these things because I'm just, I, Dan. Ataz. Ha ha. H-A-H-A-H. It is the Valley of Laughing Monkeys, both of stone and of actual monkeys. Um, and there's going to be the occasional Sioux monster in there as well, which we will go over later. Can you, can you spell that again? H A H A H. Okay. Because I want you to know that I looked this up. I I Googled this just now to see if you were just shooting me. First of all, it came up with uh, the video for Jurassic Park that says, ah, 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 you didn't say the magic word. And then, (laughs) and then Chult. And then number three on the list is the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ translated. So I don't know what to make of this. <laughs> Thank you, Google, for adding clarity. Yep. Um, and then finally in the ruins is the town of Omu. Omu is a massive metropolis ruin. It is uh, nestled in this little valley. Um, that it's like the fabled Xanadu. Or... It, it, it is very much the Zabala and Xanadu or... Um, the city of gold, El Dorado. El Dorado. It yeah. it has that feel. Even the ruins of Atlantis, if it wasn't underwater, like that kind of thing. Yep. Um, it is. It was the religious center to the old ancient Chultan Empire. Okay. So there are shrines to all of their gods here. All nine of them. Um. Well. Oh, sorry. Nine. Eleven of them. And um, a lot of the Tomb of Annihilation module focuses here so i'm not going to be spending a lot of time it's basically you want to grungs and ancient gods who want to fuck your shit are there a bunch of lizard folk walking around in here too like I there feel like is there lizard be. folk okay. are hugely um numerous within the island of chult as are like tabaxi and tortolans and all of these Tortolan? weird Tortolan? sorry turtles not- turtles tortolans is what wow calls turtle people fuck your world warcraft dan sorry I'm getting glared at by Dave, too. Yeah. I'm moving further away from you. <laughs> but anyways, so there are Tortles and Tabaxi and various other races here as well. So, guys. Yeah. That was a long way to go to ask, does Chult interest you as a player? Does it interest you as a DM? Let's, let's, let's grab the dice and talk about it. I got a 10. I got a 15. I got a 2. Dave. This seems like the kind of place that I could adopt... Without, well, hold on, sorry. Player first? Player first. Let's player do player first. first. Okay. Uh, as a player, uh, yes, but it would have to be the right DM. I wouldn't trust any, just any DM to do it justice. Yep. It seems like there's a lot of rich history. There's a lot of uh, stuff that even like you maybe haven't even covered that goes on. Oh, on Schult. I-, I haven't covered quite a lot. Right, like it's, it's well here. fleshed out. Yeah. Uh, and as a player, that speaks to me. However, as a player, I'm not going to go in and do all this research ahead of time because honestly, I don't want to spoil the story for me. So I'm not sure there's... Like, this is the kind of thing that I would want introduced to me over time and I would probably want to DM first and then be a player in it so that I can kind of understand the landscape. Honestly, one of the things that Dan and I... Oh well, well, you were here for it, but we, we we talked about it before we started the the recording today. Um, we were talking about the fact that Tomb of Annihilation doesn't have new player options except for one and a half backgrounds, which is the archaeologist and anthropologist background. Yeah, um, and we're going to cover that in an episode covering backgrounds and stuff in the future. So we're not going to dig into it today, but I would only be doing this level of research if I was taking that kind of background. Right. If I'm going to be an archaeologist, I would know shit about Chult mm-hmm. beforehand. But I would. I, how do you how do you look that up without without reading the book of Tomb of Annihilation? Right. Like there's. I mean, listen to this episode, but you already are. So, like, <laughs> but 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 what do you do? How do you dig into that? And I guess that's additional work for a DM to to have to provide you yeah. with some material. So, but you're also going to have to trust that the DM is doing that same information research ahead of time i, I yeah. don't know i don't know um they have left a lot of these um very open-ended like a lot of these locations a lot of these storylines are very 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 open-ended as a dm i would love to be able to get a hold of them we're doing players first Dan. okay fine <laughs> i've been a player here 
Okay, well, talk about that because I want to know what was your. I I I loved it. I mean, there there were some mechanical issues of actually navigating through the jungles of Chult and navigating the hex grid um, that I wasn't a huge fan of at the time. But this was a f- brilliant campaign. Like I, I I this was the one I played uh, uh, Tiefling Bard styled over the uh, Charlie Daniel song uh, "Devil Came Down to Georgia," and I played a golden fiddle that I would hit people with. And your name? Uh, was Red. Oh, yeah, Redemption. Redemption Guthrie. Yeah. It's Redemption Guthrie. Yeah. It was fan. One of these days, a player is going to provide a legit name that does not infuriate me, and I'll be very happy. Um, but until then... I've had so many good ones. As a lately. Tiefling, Redemption's a good name. The fact that I made him Red Guthrie and I gave him a Southern accent made it worse. Yes. That, that, <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I... It, the campaign itself was really, really awesome. Um, my problem with specifically the Tomb of Annihilation module, and I'll just say this real quick. You spend seven-eighths of that module getting to the Tomb of Annihilation. But the Tomb of Annihilation is the, by far the most fleshed out thing on the rest of the island. Hmm. So you're feeling kind of like you're just running towards this endpoint without really diving deep into uh certain places of lore here um and then when you get to the tomb of annihilation like every single wall is intricately detailed can can i just ask is that because of the dm that you had at the time without naming names or getting into like is that a dm style issue i don't think it is um i think to a minor extent that does play into it but it's it was mostly there were so many open ends you just kind of get lost in it Right? So you have analysis paralysis. You have analysis paralysis. And when you are in the middle of the jungle trying to figure out if you get lost or not, like we have, we have a player in our Sunday group who loves random encounters. This is her campaign. Yeah. 110%. We spent more time doing random encounters than we did plot items in this campaign. And getting to and from Port Nianzar was a pain in the ass when you're in the middle of the jungle. I mean, that's fair. That's my experience as a, as a player. Now, that can be mitigated very easily by revamping the exploration mechanic to streamline it a little bit. Sure. But, okay. Um, I want to explore some of these storylines. I want to explore the fact that they have these guides that lead you around that have their own wants and desires and, and goals and ways to maybe manipulate the party into doing their ends, right? So... Um, there's a lot of intrapolitical intrigue as well. There's zealots there's this entire dude wandering through the jungle that everyone wants to get their hands on including ties into like uh lords of thunder or whatever that's called storm king storm, storm king's thunder good yeah. lord dan sorry is, is, that, is that a wow thing as well no okay so there, there's an entire connection to storm king's thunder with a frost giant boat uh, moored off the south of the island because they're sending in raiding parties trying to find this dude so there's frost giants wandering through this jungle as well. Like, there's so many cool things going on, and I haven't even touched the fact that it's old ruins that you're going through, finding out puzzles and traps like you're Indiana fucking Jones. It's great. As a player, it's great. Okay, sidebar. Before I get into my thing, sidebar. I feel like Lords of Thunder is got to be the greatest hair metal band that doesn't exist yet. Oh, they've got to exist. And you both reached for your phone to look him up. Anyways, but so, but doesn't that, sound, that sounds like it's got to be a hair metal band yeah. from the 80s. Honestly, the thing for me that excites me is is the evocative place names that you didn't get into. You went into the very specific locations and whatnot, but there are things, Sky Lizard Mountains, right? Valley of Dead, Peaks of Flame. There are the Cobalt Mountains. That's the Valley of Dread. That's the Valley of Dread? There's an R. There is an R. Still, Valley of Dread. That is amazing. I want I want to play in these things. I want to wander around and figure out what this, the Mist Cliff Mountains sounds fun. The Dread I'm uh, sorry, the Valley of Dread? The Dawn Warrior, which is an island, and I have no idea what it does. Um the Mother of Mists. Yeah, which, which is another series of islands. Yeah, so there there are all sorts of, of provocative names here that I want to I want to go and I want to explore as a player I want to dig into these things I can understand how it would be frustrating because Dan you've got the map on the wall 
right? And I can see that it's half filled out. You kind of know where some things are, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, that's that's so unfortunate. I want to wander around. I want to uncover what is in every single one of these hexes. Do you like legitimately get to fill that in as you yes. play? That's freaking cool. When we when we sat down, we were all like, "We're going to do Tomb of Annihilation." My, our buddy Nick, who is a, a fantastic guy, I love him to death. I've mentioned him millions of times on the podcast. He went to a printer and blew up and printed off the map so we could post it on the wall. You see, you see, there's the actual one beside it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, Nick blew up a, a huge one so that you guys could color on it and draw on it and all yeah. that shit, right? So, um, cool. and make notes. So anyway, yeah, I'm a I, I'm super stoked about playing here. As a player, but I'll tell you, I will be completely upfront about it. If I know that we are going out into the middle of fuck off nowhere to do shit, I'm gonna pick one of the one of those classes, like uh, the rogue scout, or um, I, I don't know the. I'm gonna ask to be the uh, revised ranger hunter, right? Like there are a number of different ways that I do this. Well, maybe a barbarian, something, a druid. I'm going wilderness with it. I'm gonna min max the fuck out of it right because i do not want to be that poor asshole that is clomping through the the jungles wearing heavy armor and full plate carrying a shield and and just like all of that is just going to be a pain in the ass and i don't want to like i gotta i gotta pick my my character you you really do correctly yeah. right um i suffered as a bard in in the jungles of chult because there's no social there's very little social. The second you leave the main civilization points, this sounds to me like 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 a DM problem more than anything else. Because as a dungeon master, I have to know that there is a bard in my party who needs social. So I'm going to add another guild to the story that is also looking for things. And yes, shit like that. Right. When, when we ran it, we had a guy who who runs very very close to the modules. So like it, it was he didn't want to add anything new. But that being said, there are factions you could come across here. Um, but a lot of it is random tables, so we just didn't come across a lot of them. Yeah, so like these are these are things that I would myself as as a player, I'm gonna lean into the the location and away from certain kinds of of builds. This is not the place that I'm going to play a oath of redemption paladin. I feel like I'm gonna suffer. But mm-hmm. a nature cleric would be absolutely phenomenal here. You want your detect poisons and diseases. Oh, yes. You want your create water, right? You want to be able to purify water and that kind of shit. If you're going to do something like this, as a player, that's what I'm focused on. Yeah. Now, it should be noted, Adam, that I did look it up, and there is a band called Lords of Thunder. Yeah. Um, they are a metal band. Nice. Um, and their About Lords of Thunder on their band camp says... For eons we have slept, awaiting the opportunity to be reborn in battle. The time is now for the Lords of Thunder to awaken. My next College of Swords bard is going to be a Lord of Thunder. The evil god Deoric has summoned his minions in hopes of purging all who would resist him. I don't know what their music sound like. They're my soundtrack for tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good yeah. luck with that, Dave. <laughs> okay. So, so as, as DM, same order? As DM, same order. Dave... Let's roll for it. I haven't rolled enough dice lately. Apparently neither does Dan. 19. 17. Same order. Same yeah. order. All right. I'm glad we did that. <laughs> uh, as a DM, I like this because it... I mean, it, it's like most other campaign settings, only in a campaign setting. Like, it, it gives it gives me a world. I don't need to leave it. It's all fleshed out. It's right there. It's ready to go. It gives me a political atmosphere that, I mean, probably lack thereof, but it gives it more on, like, a, a city yep. scale. Uh, and, and it's just, it, 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 there's enough there that I can take the parts that I want and add in the other parts that I want and make this really what my players want. Yeah, this feels like they've created a skeleton for you that you just need to flesh out. You're not building this from the ground up. Yeah, and I, and I like that. I don't have to worry about drawing a map and providing this information. That's the kind of stuff that I that I do like to do. But at the same time, I get busy and I don't always have time for this. And this would make it so much easier. And I don't have to read about a thousand years of political intrigue in order to figure it out. Yeah, important are, and a lot of the civilizations here are relatively new as well, right? 
and there's a rapid changeover that happens as uh, political entities from outside of Chult invade to take over the trade routes, right? It, it's There's so many things you could do with this. As for me, I like it. I really want to go and I, I would want to run it fairly close to the module. I wouldn't want to try to interject a lot of my stuff because there is so many things that I have never seen. But in doing my research, I'm like, wait, that was a thing that we could have done? Shit, I would have loved to have done that, right? So um, I, I want to go into that to explore those. However, there are several, like Tomb of Annihilation was fairly early in their um, writing. In and, the publication. In of their Fifth publication Ed. of yeah. Fifth Ed. And it shows in some very glaring ways. There's a couple save or die. Um, or if you get into this encounter, you're it's a TPK kind of moments. Well, so so reason, I mean that's that's just a DM <clears throat> having to get through it and and there there's there's a reason for that though. And the reason for that is that this was supposed to be Tomb of Annihilation was supposed to be the 5th edition adaptation for Tomb of Horrors. Yes. Before uh, Yawning Portal came out, right, and you get the actual Tomb of Horrors, this was the adaptation of it. So there it, there was a lot of save or die stuff and yeah. apparently they've just moved some of it out into the jungle. Well, yes, but also the Temple of the Nine Gods, which is the Tomb of Annihilation. Spoiler alert. It, it That's fairly early on you learned that. Um the the Temple of the Nine Gods is the Tomb of Horrors. Yeah. Like, almost beat for beat. No, I know. Like, that's... It was a direct adaptation, but they yeah. add, they built an entire... They built an entire thing around it. So, yeah. so, like, you still get all that, but, like, I'm talking, like, a social encounter in the first couple sessions could end your campaign. Hmm. It's, it's a bit weird. So, um... I would definitely massage it. I really want to try it, and I would rework these stupid, uh geographical exploration rules they have. This hex grid exploration mechanic is hot garbage. I want to tweak it and at least see what I could do to make it a little bit more interesting. For me, I want to find out what this mechanic is because I haven't played with it and I am really intrigued. I want to know what it is and how to make it better. Uh, if you're complaining about it, I trust you. You understand the mechanics of 5th Ed pretty well. So I'm like, ah, we can find a happy medium. We can adapt this and, and make it better. But um, yeah. I would very much 100% not follow the module. I would come to Chult and I would do my own thing. I would pick up all of the pieces that were there from albino dwarves to Eric Ocker societies and so on and so forth. And, and I would say, here it is. You guys have a, just a sandbox. Go play in it. By the way, there is a tomb of annihilation. Like if you come across it, you can go into it. You can do it. That's part of it, right? It, you be aware of the fact that there are frost giants that are wandering around hunting this dude. That's a thing that's going on, right? There are going to be a lot of encounters here that you cannot win, and your best option is to run away. Yep. And I would just be upfront about it. This is going to be a difficult but fun sandbox to play in. Go crazy. Here are the rules. And I could, I could just almost... What two of annihilation goes up to what level fourteen or something? It's one to fourteen. I think so. Yeah. So I would run this at, at uh, you guys start at level eight. You work up to level eleven. Um, and the module does give you rules where if you're starting at level nine or starting at level eight, here's the thing. Like it gives you something. Good. That, 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 that's really helpful. Yeah. But I would just say here you go. You can never get above this certain level. So there's always that level of danger. And I would run a campaign until my players get tired of it. Right. Run around. And eleventh level, by the way, just confirmed. Eleventh, it goes to eleventh is is what they're saying, or higher if you have a different okay um, starting. Oh, point. Uh, the Tomb of Horrors, I think, is level fourteen in uh, Yawning Portal. Yeah, eleventh so. level is low for encountering the Tomb of Annihilation, uh, but it's supposed to be deadly. Yeah, right. And so I would I would lean into that, and I just I I would want to play with all of the stuff that you've talked about that is so weird and different from everywhere else, like. The Aldani, the Lobster Men, right? Yep. That's crazy. We don't we don't have that anywhere else. This is the first that I've heard about them. And I do research on this shit all of the time. <laughs> Why do they not show up in Volos? Right. I I want I want to play with these things. These are new, interesting, fun aspects to Fifth Edition that I want to I want to sink my my hands into. Chult really does. I mean, I I, I knew nothing about it coming into this today. Like full. Oh you know, yeah, I, like nothing. 
But this really does feel like it could be a, a standalone campaign setting, right? And I don't mean in the same way like, you know, the Sword Coast is. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking more like this could be its own world, its own book, its own again additional setting like uh, like Ravnica, like Theros, like Eberron. You could really use it that yeah, way. Yeah, whereas, whereas Eberron is a world, but then you get things like Barovia and Ravnica, which are... Very, very small geographically comparatively. You don't get a whole world. Mm -hmm. You get a city, right, with Ravnica. I mean, the, that city's massive, the size of a country, but you get one country. You get, um, in Barovia, you get a valley to run around in. Yep. Um, I That's feel, smaller than Chult. That, than Chult, yeah. So I feel like I really want a Chult source book almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It, no, I'm that's with what you. I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. All right. So if we're good guys, we're going to break for commercial and then come back to talk about some of the den denizens that live within. Sure. Hello, everybody. You guys know me as Coffee Bitch Dave. You've heard me on quite a few episodes at this point, as well as the Call of Cthulhu miniseries. Uh, I'm hijacking this commercial spot right now just to let you guys know a little bit about the campaign builder. Adam and Dan are super into this, and they've done a really good job at not just helping you with the three pillars of of D, &D but almost that fourth unknown one and that's the transition between them it really helps you learn a little bit more and keep your players engaged which is one thing that i've found can be kind of hard it's that downtime between exploration role playing and combat and they do a great job anyways guys check it out you guys will like it go do it now i mean maybe not right now because you're listening to another episode but like when you're done go to that now do it do it do it and now back to the episode. Welcome back. Uh, so now we're going to cover the denizens, the living, breathing occupants of the island of Chult. And we're going to cover a couple of the weird rules, including some new diseases, some new curses, and these bullshit navigation rules. Um, Tell us how you really feel, Dan. Yeah, they're fucking garbage. Anyways, we're going to do creatures first. Hot garbage, I think you said. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are many new and unique monsters that call Chult home. There are dinosaurs. Did I mention that there are dinosaurs inside of Chult? Did you just realize that you said that cult chult home? That cult chult home. <laughs> that chult called home. So there are many new and unique monsters that call chult. Fuck. <laughs> that called chalk home. <laughs> this is going to stay in the episode. <laughs> there are many new and unique monsters that call chult home. Yep. There are dinosaurs that I mention. Dinosaur, like it, it's yes. no fun the third time around. Yeah. Yeah. It's dinosaurs. Okay. They're flying monkeys. Why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be? There's countless undead. There are dragons and giant snakes. And all of these are fairly mundane compared to some of the things that they present in this book. I'm going to go through the list of some of these weird ones that I want to throw in all my campaigns ever. Sure. Okay. Uh, first off the bat is the Zorbo. The Zorbo. I fucking love the Zorbo. I I pulled the mini for this out of the fucking random pack. Mm -hmm. And I went, what the shit is this? And I looked it up and it's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. It is like a small sized angry magic koala. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's, it's tiny. It's not even small. It's tiny. No, it's small. It's small. It is actually small sized. Yeah. Okay, the mini is tiny. He's yeah. Very, very small. They are the rust monster of Chult. The Zorbo is a small, koala-looking monstrosity that will disintegrate your protective items, both magical and not. If you hit it with a magical sword, if it hits you, it disintegrates your armor one AC point at a time. It's so it's like an ooze. It's kind of like an ooze. However, it also gains bonuses from its surroundings, depending on what it's touching. If it's standing on wood, its AC is 17. If it's standing on metal, its AC or stone, its AC is 19. Cool. It, it's like what, what's the name of that superhero? Uh, Morpho? No. Morph. Met, met, uh, oh no, Metamorpho. Metamorpho. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pain in the ass. That's a, that's a that's a bit of a deep cut for DC. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, next is the Chewinga. The Chewinga is a small, tiny, or sorry, a tiny elemental fey like creature that is like a spirit pygmy almost. They are uh, generally benign, but more benevolent than uh, malevolent. Uh, and they want to help the party through the jungles. They're kind of forest elementals. In like, a sort. Like, yeah, okay. They're like little black things with big masks. They kind of look like the, uh, the Kakamora from mm -hmm. um, Moana 
for those who watch kid movies, I I watch too many Disney movies. Anyways, um, so they're generally benevolent. However, they have ADHD and will just leave your party in a lurch if they see something shiny and move away. So um, they're 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 these cool little things, and they're not really meant to attack. They're CR half, right? Um, but anyways, uh, there are Sue. Oh, hold on, are these so? You just run right past these things before we can even like digest them. Okay, I gotta, sorry. I gotta ask: Is this the look? Listen, mm-hmm. uh, from um, hey, listen, kinda. Uh, they're not winged; they are like bipedal little skinny, like pygmies. Pygmies, yeah, yeah. But um, but they're from straight from Zelda. They're, they're yes, they oh, they listen. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, they've got that feel. Um, I would also accept like Princess Mononoke has tones of these as well. In terms of like anime cartoons, which I'm now getting a look from both of you, so I'm going to. I, I, no, I'm following you. Okay, cool, yeah, yeah. cool. Um, next, it pisses me off that Princess Mononoke is the only thing he's pronounced correctly this fucking episode. Are the Sue Monsters? No, sorry, Sue Monsters. Fuck you. <laughs> uh, Sue Monsters are um, they hearken from much much older editions of the game and are now in Five E with a fierceness that only a psionically powered orangutan can have. Oh, okay. vicious, violent, and oh yeah, psionics. Um, they are these horrible things, and they you will encounter them all over the jungles because they will hunt you down to eat your face. They stun you with their mind and then go orangutan on you. I would probably not use these. I don't. I don't like psionics traditionally in my games. I like psionics as far enough as psychic being a damage type. And you have some creatures that are good at it, like uh, Mind Flayers. Yeah. The moment that you get psionic spell lists, I'm out. You've just added an extra level of bullshit complication. I really like that, but it's always a fucking afterthought. In every edition of D&D, it's always guilty of power creep. No one's ever prepared for it. And I would throw it at the, the fucking window. The way I would play these is they have that, you know... Um, I would play into the horror aspect of the jungle and have like... Uh, the the cackling waves, like the distant uh, din of monkey laughter and hooting and hollering, it, that just proceeds with these things. It, and It's funny because you keep saying these things, and I know they're stat blocks, and I don't know why I know it, but these guys are low CR. They You're are. supposed to run into packs of these fuckers. Yep. Right? So the idea is that they're like CR 1-ish, give or take, and they're going to pop in as eight of them at a time to, to wreck house. Yep. So, like, they're scary, but they're not... You said orangutans, and I went, oh, I pictured chimpanzees based on the stats. They're market. too big to be chimps. Are they? Yeah, they're large. Hmm. Are they? Yeah. Anyways, next is the Camadan. The Camadan is the displacer beast-looking jaguar, um, except something far worse. The Camadan is a jaguar that happens to have several poisonous snakes growing out of its back because magic jungles suck. Holy moly. Yeah. By the way, these snakes, uh, it, there's like four of them. They each get an attack and they do 2d6 poison damage. Each. And they each get an attack. These things will tear your party uh, apart no matter what level. You guys ran into one of them and you were level 12. And these guys are like CR6. And it nearly... Four. Four? Yeah, they nearly killed two of you. Yeah. Um... Now, because I don't want you guys thinking all I'm talking about is animals here, we have the Triflower Frond, which is a uh, plant that also wants to kill you. Sue Monster's medium. Oh, it's, mo- it's medium? Yeah. But okay. still, I mean, an orangutan is medium. Yeah. Um, so the Triflower Frond has th- uh, three blossoms that can knock you unconscious, that cover you with acid, or straight up grab you and poison you. And they're half CR, so get ready to fight a bunch of them. Good. Finally, there needs to be more plant monsters in D&D. It is bullshit that we don't have enough. I like This is a constant issue that I run into. And I would assume that Tomb of Annihilation, the book, should be presenting another dozen or so. Um, there aren't a lot because there are like uh, man-eaters. And, like, man-eaters are present in the book as well, which are big plants that eat men. Um, probably women too. Probably. Just yeah. human things that walk by them. They probably do some... Like animals, like camadans, they probably eat them. But um, there's a few, but there's not, like, again, it's still under supported in my mind. 
Still not under supported as Fey or Oozes, but it makes sense. Yeah. I don't um, want to talk about Oozes. I just had a bad experience. Dave just got killed by a, by a gelatinous cube in last night. No, nights. I got killed. Oh, by because, an ochre jelly. That's right. Uh huh. No, I got killed because a party member decided to run away and leave the rest of us to die. I am angry. I am bitter. I will not get over this. It's true. I did it. I'm a DM. As 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 someone who has uh, fireballed one of your characters uh, more than a decade ago, and you still won't let me live it down, I I, I believe it. Okay. Um, next, because every single uh, Wizards of the Coast book has to have some cute, adorable uh, animal, we're going to do the Almirage. The Almirage is a, and I'm going to read this word for word out of my little notes here. Um, I can't cover Chalts without talking about these hornier bunnies. I say they're hornier because they're bunnies, which are legendarily horny animals, just they have a literal horn on their head. They're unicorn bunnies. <laughs> There's nothing special about them other than the fact that they have they're bunnies with a unicorn. Like a horn unicorn on in the middle of their head. Why do the jackalope? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um they're they're cute. Adorable. I want them all, except they multiply like Tribbles trapped in a uh, Viagra factory. You could have just said like rabbits, Dan. You could. Yeah, but Tribbles trapped in a Viagra factory is visceral and I love it. <laughs> That's a lot of fur. That's a lot. That's a lot, lot of fur. fur. It's like Dave. Well, it's the right level of fur. Yeah. Gross. Um, I wanted to talk quickly about the Batiri tribe goblins. They are a uh, tribe of goblins that are throughout the island of Chult that um, are like, again, the Kakamora of Moana. They are like a goblin in a totem pole had a baby. And yes, that's as awesome as you think it is. They're goblins that stack up on top of each other and walk through the jungle as like a tall Man, thing. Each, with, each one with a different like wood mask. Here, Dave. Like that. I'm showing Dave a picture. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. B- <laughs> Batiri goblins. I love them. They There's... make up a large popula- portion of the population on Chalt, don't they? Like, they're they're quite prevalent. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few big tribes of them. Yeah, yeah but they've got, like, regions, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. There's no joke here. He, he, <laughs> I was waiting for the joke. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm injecting information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they're, they're everywhere in the jungles of Chalt. Um... There's Tinder, not the dating app. He's a dragon. Big red one. Floats around the peaks of flame. Uh, there's Nanny Poo 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 Poo. Nanny Poo Poo, um, who is an old lady who lives by herself in the middle of the jungle who has some off putting traits. Do you guys see where this is heading with her? She smells like poo? N- no. It's right there. Okay, so her off putting traits are she's a hag? Yeah. yeah. She's, she's straight up a hag. Yeah. Um, and then there's Aramag. Aramag is a dragon turtle that sits right at the top of the Bay of Chult. And this massive port town, central and important to any and every trade route, now has a dragon turtle demanding, um... Tribute. Tribute every time you pass. And he makes it known that he could wreck your shit in a moment if you don't pay him. So boats pay him. No one knows where the ho- his horde is, and no one has bothered to try, because this guy is old, angry, and ancient. That's a shell of a problem. Yeah. What's his name? Aramag. Okay. I like it. Okay. So, those are just roughly... I mean, there's hordes of undead as well. There's yuan There's Grungs. There's lizard folk. We've already mentioned the Terra folk, and Aracokras, and Tabaxi, and... Tortles. It's a fairly eclectic group of denizens. Let's roll our dice, figure out which ones we like, what what we would... Like, which ones we like, which ones we don't. Sure. I got five. Natural 25. I got a natural 20. I got a 19. I feel ripped off. <laughs> Good. Fuck you. All right, so... Justice um, for Dave. Just hits for Dave. So, um, here's, here's what it comes down to for me. I would absolutely want to play with this um, dragon turtle. And his horde would be something that I would play with all of the time. Dragon turtles are underutilized. I agree. And so I want to do that. However, in order to do that, I feel the need to whip out ghosts of salt marsh and grab the nautical boat. Oh, rules. you totally can side by side with this. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that. 
Uh, my least favorite thing is your horny bunny. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit about your flumps or your fucking what, what the hierophant? Hierophant, yeah. Like I keep your cuddly fucking Care Bear shit out of my D and D. It's good <laughs> for a one shot, but if you have it there, I'm going to murder the goddamn crap out of it because it's only I'm only happy when the bottom half of them are missing and they've got a line of intestines hanging out as they're crawling towards you, screaming, "Save me, save me, please! I've always loved you." That is a DM is my number one instinct when it comes to these things. That's why they exist, in my opinion. And so I'm just going to put those aside. And I'm going to do intrigue and fun and high adventure because I don't need to shit my campaign. So I I am on. I am fucking Ozzy biting the head off a bat on this one. So Dave, what's your favorite and least favorite? Uh, I, you know, you said you didn't like the the rabbits. You know, I, I'm not sure if I do or not. They they might be fun. They might not. Um, it depends on your players, right? Like, I know I've had players in the past who would really be drawn to these, but others that wouldn't. Uh, I like the idea of the little, the little pygmy guys. What were they called? The, um, Chewungas. The Chewungas. Okay? Chewungas. Because, I mean, they're immediately going to be called Chimichangas, okay? And these are going to be guys that sneak into camp in the middle of the night when they're in the jungle and steal that really important item just because, oh, that's neat. I like it. And then they've got to go and deal with something that's just not reasonable at all. But they could absolutely just beat the crap out of it if they wanted to, right? But these are a constant problem, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're the infestation that is going to harass and hinder them in non-meaningful ways the whole way through. And there's nothing they can do about it. They can kill 60,000 of them. There are going to be 61,000, okay? I don't care. This could be a lot of fun. Because you know what? I hope my players are listening right now. Fuck you. <laughs> okay, I like. Okay, we've gotten two very combative fucking DMs right away. Screw you and your horn bunnies, and fuck you, players. Here's a thing that's gonna mess with you. No, yeah, campaign. no, specifically Dave's Dave's players. No, I, I agree. Fuck you. No, um, <laughs> no. Uh, my my big thing is I, I like where you're going with this, but I would start off very simply. Whenever they don't have a watch, or the watch falls asleep, or they fail a perception check, or whatnot, they discover that all of the gear that was not inside a tent is now stacked in a tower. And when they come out, there nothing bad happened to it. And it's yeah. going to be slow little things like that. For example, there will be two signs scrawled in common and but uh, like misspelled and letters backwards, like a, like a child did it. But it's going to and one sign is going to say this way to health, and the other one is going to say this way to health, and they're going to point in two opposite directions. And it's just going to be shit like that yeah, all the, the time. The, the I feel like the the not island of Chalt uh, really puts your players on edge. Yeah, and this is a great tool to keep them on edge with absolutely no repercussions. There is <laughs> there. They also have mechanics that we will be covering shortly after we're done this that help keep your players on edge the entire time. Even better. Yeah, that's fantastic. I really like the idea of them coming across trip wires, and the only thing that happens is a bunch of leaves fall down on them. <laughs> There's no trap involved. It's just. It's just ta-da, confetti, right? Like, and, and that's it. That is the kind of shit that I would do with these little creatures. I would do that. There's like a piranha that's been inflated, and you like step on all it goes. <laughs> it's a blowfish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I would do that like a dozen times in a row, and then I would drop something big on them. I like the idea too of them having just like like the bladder of a, a like a lizard folk bladder that they're using as a whoopee cushion. Like, I would just go straight fucking ham with this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and and you, you'd have the room to do it. Um, personally, I love the Batiri tribe goblins. Yeah, they're neat. Oh, what did what did you not like? You didn't tell us what you didn't like, Dave. Dave doesn't like psionics. No, I don't like psionics. I, like, don't get me wrong... Doing the Eberron series gave me a little bit more of a look into the Kalash Tar, and I think that's really interesting. That's a cool story that's neat to come across once in town, and you have a small encounter with it, but you do not, you don't build a campaign around it. You don't have these things that are going to pop on them at any given time. You don't make it, you don't make them have to worry about planning for this. You can have it as an encounter, but they shouldn't be taking they shouldn't be wasting spell 
known spells in order to counter this. This shouldn't be, this should be an afterthought. This should be flavor. This should not be content. It, does that make sense? It makes a little bit sense, yeah. I, I, uh, I, unless your campaign is about that shit. If unless your you campaign's want, about yeah, that shit, yeah. You want to do that, great. But and that's, that, for me. that's what I was going to say is, um, Chult very much feels like that, 19, like I mentioned earlier, that 1920s pulp expeditionary, like, uh, following the jungles, blah, 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 like the land of the lost level stuff. I would want to play a horror campaign in Chult. With Sioux monsters chasing you in the deep dark of the jungle. You're talking with black the, voodoo level. I'm shit. talking like black voodoo level shit. Like, like, kind of break from the norm, which is just, oh, there are skeletons and shit. Because there's skeletons and shit. But there's, you know, intelligent, psionic monkeys chasing you down. And you just hear them before they get to you because you just hear the hooting and the hollering. Do you remember, like, a long fucking time ago, we did, I want to say it was the first mailbag episode... But it might have been the second one. Alexander and other Skip Davis sent in a question that I had to fucking look up. Oh, the those uh those uh humanoid creatures that have like the The translucent like their skin is invisible, you can only see the skeletons moving. They look like that guy from Chernobyl. No, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, not none of you guys saw Chernobyl? No. I did, yeah. The the there was the patient that from Chernobyl that had like the translucent skin. No, no. Firefighter guy? Yeah. I don't remember that. It's fairly central to the plot. Well, I remember the guy, but I don't remember the, the visual. Anyways, anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, these guys were, in like, invisible, except oh. for their skeletons, right? And so, and we were talking about the idea that they would have, like, war paint on their flesh so that it floats in front of the skeleton, right? And just, like, really cool, creepy, voodoo feel. Yeah. These guys, that's where I would, I would invi- inject that shit into Chult. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. In an instant. Yeah, definitely. Um... To be honest, I don't like the Kamadan. Um, if you were to have a... Uh, That's because you just got fucked up by one. That's it's why. not because it's you just got fucked up by one. It's just it's too close to the look of a Displacer Beast. In my mind. Like, Displacer Beasts are an iconic monster. And now you... it it It's kind of like you've put a floating spaghetti monster next to a Beholder. But that's kind of what I like about it because... As a DM, when you get players like you, when I describe a player and you're immediately like, oh, it's this guy and I know how to fight it. No, no, no. I want, like, I don't want to reflavor a creature. I just want a creature I can input that is going to throw you for a loop that you're not going to see every day. I, I would recommend if you have a player like me who does that shit, punish them. And then break that habit like Adam did with me, and I don't do that fucking shit anymore. It's true, he doesn't. He's straight. I mean, he won't even say it. Uh, every once in a while, there'll be a thing, especially when I drop a mini that's that's huge size or larger or gargantuan. I put it on, on the map, and Dan goes, "Oh, cool, a <clears throat> large mini." And then he picks it up <laughs> and looks at it, right? Like, and, and, he, and he holds it in his hands, and he puts it down, and goes, "That's really neat." And then he sits there and wonders, "What did Adam do to this stat block to fuck with me?" <laughs> and a lot of the time. I haven't done anything. It's just fifth ed, so it's different than what you remember. Yeah. Right? So, um, but no, you're right. I, I like the Kamadan because it is thematically different and yet similar enough. I'm that way with all of the different kinds of spiders, though, right? If I throw a giant wolf at you, you're going to think dire wolf. You're not going to think winter wolf or warg, right? And so there are other analogs like that that I can use all the eh, time. Fair enough. I mean, there, but like, Camadans, they they scream like something that has been warped in the jungles of Chult. Displacer beasts are mages fucked with this, right? And it's got the weird displacement me- mechanic to it. Like it it it's far more magical and iconic in my mind. That's why it's why I don't like the Camadan. Like the Camadan is just like, wait, this is a, a cat Medusa. A, yeah, it's just like a beastish kind of thing. Yeah, it's too beasty. All right, but anyways, uh, that's that that's that's my opinion. Um. We're going to move on real quick. We're going to cover some of the mechanics that they've brought in um, as part of this topic, the section as well, before we hit up going to the shout out. Um, key to the adventure in um, the Tomb of Annihilation is the Death Curse. The Death Curse is a great thing to put in all of your campaigns if you want a good little motivating factor. Uh, basically, those who have been resurrected are losing a hit point of out of their maximum hit point pool every day at midnight. And if they die, their soul is reaped, reaped, and you cannot resurrect them. 
straight up, if anyone dies, you can't resurrect them until you stop this curse from happening, right? Um, it's this is a massive and like we're talking like session zero information in the tomb of annihilation thing. Um, this is the reason why you go to Chult is to fix this in the in the tomb of annihilation storyline. So um, this death curse is really really cool. Um, paired with the death curse is a way to do death saves called the meat grinder. And the meat grinder is a optional rule. Dave, Dave's eyebrows just like skyrocketed. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's already gru- is an optional rule for an already grueling campaign. Selecting to go meat grinder means to succeed a death save requires a 15 plus, not a 10 plus. For those who want to play on hardcore Doom Slayer heavy metal music blaring in the background mode, or just want to buy that furniture from me because you like to get punished. <laughs> Uh, yep, I'm glad you're leaning into it, Dan. Yeah. It's about time. All right, so 15 instead of 10, hey? 15 instead of 10. That is fucking rough. On top of the fact that um, you're losing hit point maximums. And let me get this, let me make this abundantly clear. This island is full of undead. If you lose hit point maximums from any other source, you can't restore it. Not even with a wish. This is god level magic in play that is putting this death magic curse in. So it's going to take god level magic to tear this down. So, just to be clear, you can't be resurrected. If you hit death saves and come back, you're then you got a counter on you. Uh if you hit if you die and get like uh, um revivified Okay, and true, you're talking about true resurrection yeah. then. Well, well, those who have been re- uh, resurrected before the curse comes in place have this curse on them and it's slowly bleeding them dry. Okay, well. but but players can't... Can't. There's only a few limited ways you could do it in the campaign. Wow, okay. Yeah, that, that puts it on hard mode. I like that. Again, I started talking earlier about the idea that I would give you a maximum level that you could play at so stuff stays scary. I might just implement this shit in the... Yeah, in the first place, anyway. So, I like it when it's scary. Call of Cthulhu was fun because it was scary, right? Yeah, like, we sat there. Well, there was a threat. Yeah, there's a and a constant threat, and there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, you can throw a dynamite at it all day. No, because even if you succeeded on that twice in a row with critical successes, you would still take motherfucking damage, Dan. You didn't succeed twice in a row with critical successes on the throwing dynamite. Stir in the pot. Yes, I'm I goddamn did. I've listened to that episode three times because it makes me so angry. You're welcome. Anyway, so the next thing we have is we have some new diseases <laughs> as well. Um, we have Mad Monkey Fever, which is a uh, blue mist that creeps through the jungle. Um, if That's you, fun. Yeah, if you c- encounter the mist, you make a con save. And then you go, uh, if you fail the con save, you get long-term madness, which is um, the madness rules in the back of your DMG. Has those if you fit, and then you make a save every day, and every day you fail, another madness is added until you get two in a row, and then you're just just out of the campaign. You're and, done. Uh, pretty much, yeah. If you get two in a row, you're cured, you're good, and then you could get back to it. But this is probably the least impactful, huh? Yeah, that's not good. Yep. Uh, next is the shivering sickness. Uh, if you take damage from any bug on the island at all, keep in mind, there are many. There are swarms of sturges at every corner. Cool. There are giant centipedes. There are huge sections of this forest I've never mentioned that are just covered in spiders and scorpions. This place is hot and humid and tropical. There are bugs everywhere. If you take any damage from a bug... You have to roll, in chalt, you roll to catch Shivering Sickness. If you fail, you start having blurred visions and the shakes. Mechanically, this means you have disadvantage on all attacks and abilities, and you only regain half as many hit points when you're spending your hit dice, but you cannot regen any hit points during a long rest. Wow, holy shit. The long and short of this is, Bring your citronella, and they have rules for bug spray in Chult. No <laughs> kidding. Okay, so hold on. What's what's the roll though? What's the percentage? Um, it's a, I think it's a con thirteen. Holy shit! 
Which, if you're level one walking in and get bit by a mosquito, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm thinking con thirteen. Like your your wizard is just fucked. Bring your bug spray, people. No kidding. Holy yeah. shit. Um. Next is the delicately worded throat leeches. Nice. You get throat leeches um, if you go swimming in the jungle, have prolonged periods of wetness, if you drink from any source that has not been boiled and cleaned, um, not including like create water. You could create water and drink that. You'll be fine. Um, but if you catch rainwater, you'll pro- you could probably still catch this. Um, and there is a rainwater catcher that you could carry around with you to collect water as you walk through the jungle because you do not want to drink the water that is on the ground in the jungle at all. Is there like a save this. for this? So if you get this, you will make a con save or you will slowly gain daily levels of exhaustion until you die as leeches infest your throat, seal your airways, lay babies in your neck and you die choke, uh, choking and suffocating. So this isn't even like the outs. I, this is like the the inside. It is the internal leeches. I'm I'm bringing a paladin. I'm bringing a paladin because their lay on hands can get rid of one disease for five charges. Only one. Only remove disease will cure this. So there's no removing the leeches to make them feel better. Only cure disease. Only cure disease will remove it. Fucking yikes. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm fine. I'm bringing a life cleric. Yeah. Or take care of your water. And this this is going to lead me into one of the major mechanics. Survivalism in Chult matters. There are ways to collect food, ways to collect water, ways to keep the bugs off of you. And you are taking a daily inventory of it. I, as a DM, I like that. I feel like that would frustrate a lot of players. It would. And you would have to go into it acknowledging this fact. Now, a lot of groups I've had is like, well, we have a cleric with create food and water. We're good. No, no, I'm sorry. That's not good enough. I'm still watching shit. Like, and I'm I'm in the same boat where I'd still be watching. I'd still be waiting to see what happens. Uh, waiting to see who runs out of bug spray. And I'm sitting there saying, you know, all right, your cleric is going to do this. That's fantastic. Mark off your spell slot at dawn. Yep. Also, keep in mind, the chances of you getting lost in the jungles are huge. So, if you get lost in the jungle and you don't have enough bug spray, or your uh, water catcher breaks, what the fuck are you going to do? Burn it all. Pretty much, yeah. This will finally lead me to the thing I hate the most about this entire module, this entire realm, which is the grid exploration rules. Basically, for every single grid on the map is one, uh, what is it? And it's a hex grid, so. And it's a hex grid, is 10 miles across, okay? Characters can move at a normal pace of travel of one hex per day on foot through the jungle, uh, mountain, coastal, swamp, or wasteland terrain. They can travel two hexes per day if they're traveling by canoe, which there are marked rivers in the map, so you can only do that in some locations. Uh, the rate of travel up or down river is the same. So the river is moving so sluggish you can kind of move. Think jungle. Think the Amazon. You can kind of just paddle through a river wherever. Without canoes, the normal rate of travel along the river is uh, the same as the surrounding terrain. So one a day. Yeah. Right? If characters move at a fast pace, the easiest way to deal with progression is roll a d4. On a three or four, they add one additional hex that day. Moving characters take a negative five penalty to the wisdom perception check, making them more likely to miss clues and walk into ambushes. Characters could choose to set a slow pace if they want, where they roll a d4. On a one or two, they advance one fewer hex that day, um, which is one hex by canoe or none by foot. On any other results, their caution is rewarded and they travel the same distance as a group moving at their normal pace. Characters moving at a slow pace can move stealthily, as long as they're not in the open, they can try to surprise or sneak attack other creatures they encounter. I don't have a problem with any of that so far. So far, it's fairly self-explanatory. You can move fast, you can move slow, you can move normal. Right? Yep. And there are penalties, and here you go. Look, yeah. look at the grid. Let's go. All right. No, hold on. How does the tracking the miles work, though? 
You could keep track of the actual distances covered, which is 10 miles per day at a normal pace, 15 for a fast pace, 9 per day at a slow pace. But this is likely more, and it says this, this is likely to be more bother than it's worth if the group switches pace from day to day. Fair. Okay. Um, <sighs> navigation. Also, I'm sorry, my other thing about this is because it's a hex, right? You're going from one one side to another. The idea that it's 10 miles across doesn't track because from corner to corner is longer than from side to side. And you may not, you may go through a hex, but not necessarily pass the at, same direction. At a, cer- at a certain point, it's, it's negligible. And I think it, it, when it gets to like the 10 miles, that, that, that difference between point to point and well, flat it, to flat. Well, it depends on if, if the river just skirts one little corner of the hex or not, right? Like, I I don't know. I would just stick with the base rules as well, just because. Yeah. As for navigation, at the start of each new travel day, the DM the DM makes the survival check on behalf of the navigator and keeps it secret. The party selects a navigator, whether it be the guide that they chose or the player. The DM makes the roll, and the result of the check determines whether or not the party becomes lost over the course of the day. The DC of the check is based on the day's most common terrain. Which is set by, you know, 10 for lakes or coasts, 15 for jungles, and then you apply an additional plus 5 bonus to the check if the group sets a slow pace, or negative 5 if the group is moving at a fast pace. It's possible to get lost on a river by following the tributary instead of the main branch. That is fucking unforgiving. Yeah. The chances of you getting lost in this jungle are huge. And if you get lost, you're fucked. You're just fucked. There's no two ways about it. You're fucked. What are you, Dan? Fucked. Okay. Um, if the uh, if the check fails, the party becomes lost. Each hex on the map is surrounded by six other hexes. Whenever a lost pa- uh, party moves one hex, roll a d6 to randomly determine which neighboring hex the party enters. Do not divulge the party's location to the players. While the party is lost... Players can't pinpoint the group's location on the map of Chult. The next time, the next time a navigator succeeds on a wisdom survival check made to navigate, reveal the party's actual location, not where they've been, to the party. Interesting. I like it. That's super freaking unforgiving. I counter this with a Minotaur, who has a racial trait that says they cannot get lost. Yeah, Minotaurs came out after this. I know, right? Like, this is one of these conflicting rules that, as a DM, I would say the if it, the minotaur in the party is the navigator, and only under these circumstances, you'll get a mechanical bonus or advantage or I, something. I, 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 right? And I, like, I would say that the, even though there's that rule saying they can't get lost, this is a magical jungle. I, and like you said, I would give them I would increase either their a, chances. Me- a mechanical yeah. advantage or just give them advantage. To yep. the role, but I wouldn't make it impossible for this them. This is a part of Chult, right? Like, this is a, a major factor. I, yeah. I don't know why you're hating on this. I'm loving it. I want to put this in every one of the campaigns. Every single time you uh, decide to move, you, as a player, are rolling three dice, and the DM is rolling four dice every time you move a, a grid. Look how many grids are on that map. Okay. You spend more than half the time at the table, just rolling dice to see where you go. I play the game to roll the clickety math rocks. Yes, but you play the game to roll the clickety math rocks to have some sort of reward. Going from, okay, you're in a jungle spot, let's spend 10 minutes to say, okay, you're in another encounterless jungle spot. As a DM, though, watching my players rip out their hair is the reward. Right, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I hear what you're saying, Dave. You're an adversarial DM. For hilarity, not I'm, in reality. But. Yeah, no, like, I, I feel bad when I roll three 20s in a row and kill a guy. It's happened. I hope it happens again. I felt bad. I don't care. I don't lose sleep over it. No. No, I, but I do for my, my Sunday group. Like, I would lose sleep over that. I did lose sleep when one of the players died. Like, that, that fucked me up. I could not handle that. He had a destiny. And it, and it got cut short. And I was upset. But, so the idea of this, this just goes to show that I want more of that sandbox where I would take away the the storyline of Tomb of Annihilation, I would set it aside, and I would say, you have been contracted to chart the area and to bring civilization. Plant your flag in the following locations, right? And then every time... Here's the other thing. If they end up back in a place where they've been before, 
I would give them an increased mechanical ability to get rid of that idea of being lost. Oh, shit, we've been here. Yeah. Right? Well, there's one more rule that puts on top of this, and that is the general survival rule. Specifically, dehydration. There is a dehydration mechanic within the this thing of Chult. Which, if you are wearing medium heavy, uh, medium or heavy armor, uh, or just heavy clothings within the jungle, um, you and you have not drinking at least two gallons of fresh water as a character every day, you must succeed on a DC 15 saving throw or suffer one level of exhaustion. What save? Con, I assume. Con. If you are wearing any of those above items, you have you do that save at disadvantage. And if you are traveling at a fast pace instead of a normal or slow, everyone takes negative five on this saving throw as well. So if you're moving fast and wearing medium armor... And you haven't been keeping up your water intake, you're suddenly now dealing with levels of exhaustion in the jungle as well. Add on top of this the getting lost, add on top of this the managing food, add on top of this the bugs. This is one of the reasons why one of the biggest criticisms of Tomb of Annihilation is traveling through the jungle is in itself a grind. And not in a good way. I don't know. As as a forever DM, this really appeals to me. I don't know how you make exploration more intensive, and I, like the exploration has just become the number one pillar of this entire scenario. Yep. Which is one of the reasons why it's one of my, if I could DM it, one of my favorites. But as a player, it was tedious because, and and that could just be a DM thing. Yeah, and and but but no. Here's my thing. Here's my thing, Dan. If I sit down with my table and I say, hey, guys, look, help me map Chult. You are part of a guild. The guild says I want to be able to blank. Find this. Do that. Here are the, here are the check marks and whatnot. You guys build your characters for the guild to go out and do this. Stay safe. Do it properly. Good luck. How many characters will it take to get through this, this entire hex grid right and that's how if we know that we're going to sit down and we're going to play this for two years and we're going to really uncover the whole map the whole island myself as a dm i get to develop the whole island and they get to explore it and uncover it and that's not adversarial to me because they're going to have the tribe that they've found that they're yeah. allies with and there's going to be other ways for them to get around this shit what you're not talking about anywhere in here is the the magical aspects that they can do to to just automatically know where things are. Like um, uh, the idea that they can, uh, what is it, find... Uh, find the path. Well, there's, no, 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 uh, locate object, mm. right? So they can cast that and they know relatively where it is within a number of miles, right? And they can head in that direction. There are ways around this magically. There are also ways around this socially, right? And if you're a good enough party at the exploration, I think it's okay. I just think that this is a very different game than your sword and sorcery Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Yeah, let me tell you, I don't think I've ever played a version of D&D where I've had to track my food, my water, how far I've gone in a day, everything you've just mentioned. Like the, I, I, I used to have a mechanic when, when my guys first showed up in my homebrew world, they didn't have any supplies, and they had a whole train of refugees, and they were watching rations. Yep. And so they had to stop and hunt every day, and they would roll to see how successful they were on hunting. It was pretty straightforward. It was one roll per day of, of movement, right? And depending on what they would get, uh, it would be a random table, and the size of the creature that they would find, they would then get a random encounter to try to kill it, and that size would provide a certain amount of meat. And they needed a certain number of, like, you can see that this extrapolates really quickly, right? You can get really mechanical with this shit really quickly. So I understand this is dense and I understand why you, you might hate this. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's just need, a series of rolling dice. You need to know what you're getting into before you do. Yeah. And if you are just traveling, you know, a hundred miles south then you're just rolling these same dice 10 times over and over and over again. But let me tell you something. Every time you swing your sword, you're just rolling the same dice 10 times over and over again. So the difference is you're getting a sense of accomplishment. Exactly. Whereas and, this, if you're just from one jungle to jungle to jungle to jungle, it's just, it gets tedious. So me as a DM, I need to put something in that hex to say, hey, you have accomplished something here. 
Cool. And that would, I think, solve a lot of the problems, except for the mechanical scary mists and sicknesses and bugs and shit like that's that still needs to be. I like the idea, if, if you're scared of this, have them go build outposts. So that you can kind of know where the outposts are. And then you cast, you know, every day at, at, at sundown, someone casts flare from the top of it, right? And it shoots a flare up in the air and everyone around can see it and go, oh, that's where we are. Yeah. Or something like that, right? But remember, if you could see the flare, everything oh, else could see the flare too. That's part of my campaign, right? <laughs> but, but still, like, yeah. I would have a map chult campaign. And I think that would be a lot of fun. Well, we're going to be getting to talking about campaign ideas after we do a shutout, which we're going to do right now, unless we've got anything else to add about these uh, new mechanics. Nope. We're moving to the shutout. Yay. Hey, guys. Dan here again. I just wanted to let all of you who listen but may not be following us on social media in on a cool thing that's going on. Firstly, before I get into it, what are you doing not following us on Instagram, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, etc.? Get over there and follow us now. Why? Because then you don't have to wait for an episode release like this one to hear about cool things. Cool things like another giveaway. That's right, as mentioned in our last mailbag episode in which we answer the question, why Dan? We're currently doing a giveaway for a couple awesome Mimic Minis and your very own episode of the It's Mimic podcast. That's right, we will answer your question, whatever it is, at length as a special episode of the podcast to enter head over to the instagram or facebook click the thumbs up and tag two of your friends for every additional comment with two more friends tagged you get another entry and you can totally sign up on both instagram and facebook at the same time for even more entries cut off for the giveaway is on june 30th and the winner will be announced on those lovely social media platforms that you're totally going to go follow now on july 1st so good luck and on with the show okay guys so we now know about the geography, we know about the uh, civilizations and the locations and some of the denizens within Chult. Now that you have a bit of an idea of what's going on, I want to talk about um, two one-shot ideas, two campaign ideas within the island, peninsula, whatever the fuck, of Chult. So let's grab our dice and roll. I got a six. I got an eight. I got a twelve. What are we doing first, one-shots or campaign? Uh, one-shots, Dave. You do one, we'll go through the list, we'll each do one then another, and then... Campaigns. We'll, and then we'll do campaigns after. I like the idea of going to figure out what this dinosaur god heart is about. But, you know, like, really, really dig into it. Really make it hard for them. Because in order to get up to it, maybe it's inside it. you got to get into the heart to do it. Oh, yep, there's a, there's a chamber in it. Right, but, like... There should be four. <laughs> uh, maybe. Is the dragon heart work the same way? No, dragon heart has eight chambers, you're right. Does it? Uh, in D and D, no, no one's ever gotten into that. But in Adam's head, yes. Yeah, yeah, but, but like I would change it to to yeah. screw with it. I, I would make a, a source of this red liquid that seeps from it. I would give it a store like a, a just a you know where 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 does it go? Mm -hmm. You know why? I think it'd be really just that easy. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that for a one shot idea. My one shot idea is is pretty simple, and it is going to be there is a tribe on the borderlands that keeps you know, attacking one of these civilization. But you are at this this point, this city, whatever it is, go into the jungle, defeat this tribe. Yeah, cool. I, it's That's as easy as it gets, right? Instead of goblins are raiding the village, you go raid the goblins. I love it. Um, mine is uh, slightly different because have I mentioned that there are dinosaurs on Chult? A couple of times, yes. Okay. I thoroughly enjoy dinosaurs and the idea of dino racing to me is fucking incredible so i would have a one shot where your party acquires a dinosaur gets ready for the race with all of their little tricks ways to cheat everything else that you need to have and then does the race that is a full one shot or one shot session in my mind that's totally wizard <laughs> what <laughs> you, you defeated dan right yeah. what really Episode one, Phantom Menace, pod that's, racing. That's totally wizard. Oh, that's totally wizard. Just like instead of pods, have dinosaurs because it's right there. I wish I could quote something about Sabalba, but I can't pull it out of my head at the moment. Just, just. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, Dan. Oh shit. <laughs> 
So okay. no, no, no. Okay, I, I like I like the racing. That that's cool. But are you going like wacky races with with Dirk Dastardly? Or are oh, you going? Yeah, no, like or episode one, or is this Days of Thunder? No, this this is this is wacky races. You spend the first half of the session engineering fun little things you could throw behind you to slow down other racers or use to gain an advantage in the race. And then I would have a race track map throughout the city of Port Nianzaru where you move the your care your like little dinosaur. I've got an army of like dinosaur figurines upstairs. I would just move them throughout the jungle or throughout the city. No, I like it. Yeah. Next one, Dave. I like the idea of this dragon turtle that guards the bay, but I don't I I don't I don't know what I'd want to do with it. You find a sword. Yeah. But I feel like that could be a campaign idea. That not, was one not, of my campaign ideas. You just stole it. Not not just a one shot. Like just to, just to get get rid of this guy. Like just get rid of the dragon turtle. Yeah, you give him something else to focus on. This would have to be a high level one because he could. He is colossal. I I prefer my one shots to be these high levels because honestly, I don't really get past level twelve in campaigns. So when I get a one shot, I like to be able to do it. Fair enough, because I don't I don't often get to. So. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, um, I'm I'm gonna say you have been. Here's my my second one shot. You've been straight up hired by this mystery person that is being hunted through the jungle. You've been hired by them to go sabotage the frost giant boat, sink it. Cool suicide squad. Let's go. This guy who's wandering through the jungle has a whole like slew of lore and story and everything to him. Cool. Um, and that tracks. So oh, yeah, I, I, right. I, I love it. Um, for me, I like the fact that weird shit happens in the jungle with no explanation. So I would put like a galleon in the middle of the jungle. The Black Rock. Yeah. That you have to go to uh, an, a race against other groups of adventurers to attain the prize within. It's however, Arnst. However, along the way... You have to fight four-armed gorillas, which are a thing, dinosaurs, and swarms of sturges, not to mention the undead sailors who call the wreck home. Is it? Th- those are just uh, gorillians, right? Yeah. All right. So let's roll for campaign let's ideas. Roll for campaign ideas. <laughs> Fuck you, Dave. <laughs> I got a two. Justice for Dave. I got a 17. Just tits for Dave. I'm going last. Dan got a two. Good. Let's go. Awkward you, you, you've, silence. You've hit both ends. You've hit 20 and 1 now. That's good. Yeah. Okay, Dave, campaign ideas. One of them. You already told us your dragon turtle. I know. I'd like... It just, it, it, I, 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 I'm having a hard time zeroing in on one thing. This floating tower of Aarakocras. Or floating city. Or not floating, but like high up city. Yeah. Like, that... That has so much potential. Like, there, there's so much there. The they have, by the way, the leader of the Aarakocra is this ancient Aarakocra that they just call Teacher, who inside the book is described as old, gentle, and extremely manipulative. And yeah. you just go, that's a twist. <laughs> I feel like he's Master Splinter. Yeah. yeah. You don't want to go for a nanny poo poo. You don't want to, <sighs> Dave. But what are you doing with that? What are you doing with the Aarakocra? I don't know. Maybe maybe they've come under a tab. Maybe everything's figured out how to get up there. Maybe the the dragon heart has floated. Or not the dragon. The dinosaur god heart has floated over there and unleashed hell upon their city. Like, maybe maybe there's... Just... A war with the Terra folk? E- yeah. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah, like there's there's there's... There, there's something there. Like, there's a lot there. But I just... Uh, I don't know. I'm on the spot. Okay. I can't... I, uh. My idea for my for my long-term campaign evolves around the city of Mesro, which was that city of immortals. I want to know why the immortals are gone, why the city was destroyed, um, and where... Just what happened there. And I'm building the entire campaign around this. Um, because there is a lot of meat and potatoes there that you could build the entire campaign. Long-term, 1-20 to 20 campaign. Discovering a city that is just gone. Yeah, no, that, that's cool. I like that. That's really 
common for Forgotten Realms as well because it is all it's called the Forgotten Realms because there are ruins everywhere and long there were realms that were forgotten. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. No, I'm going back to my mapping chult. I want to do that hex by hex. Map as much as you can before your guys are just like, I'm done with this. Let's play. Let's play Curse of Strahd, right? I like get into it, and maybe you can come back to it with new characters later once it's been discovered. But the idea is. There are so many savage tribes and weird peoples and whatnot. Bring them into the fold. This is your Galactic Federation of Planets. Bring them into the fold or eradicate them. One or the other. Right? And that, that is what your guild says. Right? They can join society and civilization or they can be pushed back because we're taking Chult. And I think that depending on your players, that could be radically different experience. Every time they build a new campaign, every time that like... You know, they, they uncover, I don't know, 20% of the hexes and then they want to go on and play something else. They will come back later with brand new characters and 20 years have passed and so on and so forth. And we want another forward push. Yeah. Let's manifest some destiny. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but that would be the campaign, right? Like, yeah. you have to really fight with that. Are you Are we the baddies? Right? Like, really think about that. And I would play that as a DM, too. I would have, like, these are our homelands. This was a sacred burial ground that you're putting up a mini mall in. Right? <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I would hit my party with that and watch them sit there and squirm at the table. Yeah. So that is my campaign. <laughs> how, how, how to how to bring an imperialism and colonialism into your Dungeons and Dragons campaigns 101 with Adam. <laughs> well, hold on. And Terry. He's got to be involved. Oh, yeah. He's got to be involved in that. Naturally. Yeah. All right. Do you have another one, Dave? I, I do. Uh, so this Land of Ash and Smoke is interesting. I, I was thinking that maybe you could have this as uh, a, a, a doorway, a gateway, kind of into the underworld where your guys have been um, kind of burped up from the underworld. They've shown up here. The Underdark? The Underdark or the Abyss? What are you talking a about? Abyss. Okay. Okay. They've shown You're talking here. afterlife. Yeah. Okay. And they've got this this curse where they lose a maximum hit point every day. And they've got to try to figure out how to get back up to civilization or to figure out how to get rid of this. But they don't know where they are. You don't tell them that they're in Shalt. You don't tell them what they're doing. They just wake up in this land of ash and smoke. And if they go south... There is the acid boiling sea. The cauldron, yeah. Right? You go further north. They're going to think they're in hell. Exactly. There's peaks of flames just north of that. And then there's endless jungle with things that are going to kill them. Like, my guys have no idea what Chalt is. If I threw them into here, it would completely ruin it. Like, ru not ruin it, but ruin them. They wouldn't know what to do. And that's my favorite part of DMing. <laughs> All right, Dan, what's your second one? Um... Mine is a super original idea. I want to do something of like the pirates of the uh, a hot jungle island, TM, 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 TM. Um, who, like, I want to have a pirate campaign. You want to be the control. greatest pirate hunter in the world? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I only get that reference because of the two of you talking about it <laughs> all of the time. Yay. Yikes. So uh, I would base the entire campaign out of uh, Jahuka Bay and uh, uh, Jahaka Anchorage um, and, you know, build an army of pirates and raid towns along the Mother of Mists um, of, uh, you know, Port Nianzaru and Fort Belurian. I, this would be an evil campaign. You are pirate lords. Have fun. You have a jungle to rule. It, it, it just sounds f fun to me. And then that could branch off to taking out other areas, going to Am, going up to uh, these other locations, up the Sword Coast, and, uh, 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 until you're the kings of the pirate world. I like that. I mean, it, I also have Ghost of Salt Marsh for that as well. Yeah. And the entire Lazar principalities in. Everyone, there's a lot of pirate opportunities in the written modules that I don't think people are latching on to. No, and and I would go very much yo ho ho pirates. Like you're a ho. Very, very, yo. very focused on piratry. Right? So not it's not so much a you know pirates and it's it's pirates. Pirates, pirates. You're just pirates. 
So I'm, I'm focusing on the naval battles and the rules that are in Ghost of Salt Marsh. I'm, I'm fighting Sahuagin and Grungs and Yuan Ti raiding the boat from, from the shores, right? Maybe have a bit of a Viking feel with it as well. Yeah. Okay. You know what? Um, all right. Here, here's my idea and bear with me on this. I want to go evil and I want to take all of the options that are out there. The Aarakocra, the uh, lizard folk, there's Yuan T, there's Grung. There are some native uh, races that are here and I want them to come together for a treaty to drive out the interlopers with their civilizations and buildings. We've already torn down the previous civilizations. It's time to tear down these ones too. Cool. So C- the other side of colonialism. Yep. City by city, burn that shit down. I think that would be a lot of fun. Yep. Um, I, the we- guerrilla warfare you'd have with literal gorillas, like fucking yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, but, but I like the idea of your guys sitting there and trying to figure out how are we going to use this crazy mist? How I, like we're going to unleash the Sioux monsters into the streets? Just got a mental image of like a bo- a bunch of grungs with banana leaves standing on a hill. The mist is in the valley below, and all the grungs are just waving these banana leaves as fast and as hard as they can. Uh, it's a bunch of the albino dwarves just breathing really deeply, hold their breath, run up to other people, and go. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. No, uh, but I, I really think that you could lean into that shit um, with the with the knocking the civilization back. And you can run into every other thing in here. And part of that shit, getting rid of it, would be things like the Tomb of Horrors that's in there. Yeah. Right? The, this dragon turtle that's building a horde. Get rid of them. There's a freaking red dragon named Tinder. We need to get rid of this guy. Right? We're taking it back for us, and we're going to divide it up four or five ways. This island will get divvied up. Didn't Terry have an animal companion named Tinder in our in our Tuesday group? Yes, he did. What now, was it? Um, it was a vulture. That's what it was. Because he was an evil druid, and he had a vulture named Tinder. I don't think yeah. it was a vulture. It was it, it was it was a bird. Anyways, you're close enough. Yeah, it uh, was it an owl. It was something, but it was evil. It was an evil bird named Tinder. So it was a seagull? <laughs> Canadian goose. Oh, oh yeah, been. yeah, yeah, right. All right, well, anyways, guys, that's it for this week's episode on Chults. Uh, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as other, as well as dozens of other podcast apps. You can also find us at www.itsamimic.com or email us at info at itsamimic.com. Thanks for listening to the It's a Mimic podcast, and make sure to check us out next week when we're covering humans. You've reached the end of another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. Connect with us at itsamimic.com. Don't forget to subscribe and hit those share buttons. Thanks for listening and see you next week. All right, guys, uh, this episode we've been talking about a wild jungle paradise in the middle of a southern sea. And I, and I got, and we're not just talking about Dave's crotch. And is, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> no crotch should ever be called a wild jungle paradise. I can take my pants off, Dan. No, no, please leave them on. I just, oh, I'm I, pretty sure I have a warrior's mane. So, what kind of vacations do you guys want to do? One far away <laughs> <laughs> from here, whatever gets me away from you, fucktards. Um, so yeah, uh, just I wanted to know what. If you had no issues with money, what kind of vacation would you go on right fucking now? Where would you go? A cruise to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west. Where would you go? So, uh, dice, pick it up. I got a 17. I got a 14. I'm going last with an 11. Um, I would go to probably the Yukon, somewhere north. And Don't go isolated. radiance. Don't, yeah, no, avoiding radiance. Uh, but uh, somewhere north isolated as long as it is cold and has a strong internet connection and I am alone uh, for two weeks. I feel like it's probably going to have cold beer too. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, I'm not much for the warmth. I've lived in the Caribbean and I hated every minute of it. I want to go somewhere cold. Yeah, I, I get that. Um uh, like, ideally, what I'd want to do is go to space. If I can go anywhere. I don't want to go north or south or east. I want to go up. I mean, that's... I guess that's not really north, is it? No. No, that's, right. that's up. Yeah, so, it's, it's just it's just up. So, I would I would like to go to space. But, 
seeing as that's not really a place that we can go yet. Elon Musk, call me. Um, <laughs> we can... Uh, Sponsor us. I, I, I guess say, like, my thing has always been that I want to go to Ireland. Always, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I was always, I had planned right after high school to go to Ireland with uh, your brother, Dan. Oh, God. Who I know doesn't listen to the podcast, so I'm going to throw him under the fucking bus here. And he and I did this thing where one of us had money, but the other one didn't for our entire 20s. So there was always one person that could uh, that could afford to go on the vacation. The other person couldn't. And by the time that that person raised enough money, the other person was broke ass again. We just lived our 20s that way. Yeah. And now he is getting married and he has disappeared out of my life for the last two years. And I'm like, dude, when, 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 when are we ever going to do this? We both have, well, we both quote unquote have money now, but like we can sort this shit out. Let's do this. And he, uh, he actually sent me a message, uh, not that long ago saying, so I think my honeymoon is going to be to, I, we're going to go to Ireland and it's going to be here and here and here and all the places we had talked about. Of so I, I am bitter as shit. And if I had the opportunity to go, I'd go to all of them first. And I would carve his name into the fucking sidewalk. And it would be, well, I'm not going to call him out by name right here, but he'd be, you suck. Right? Like, I would straight up, like, on the Blarney Stone. There would Just be in graffiti. the middle of the Blarney Stone? Yeah. Yeah. I like so, it. Yeah. So, I, I'm going on vacation out of spite. Right <laughs> Dave? Now, let me be clear. I, I feel like I'm fairly well-traveled. I've been... All over. I mean, I haven't been everywhere, but you know, I've been to Europe. Continue, I've, Johnny Cash. What are you saying? I've, I've yeah. been to a. I've been to a few states. I've been to all, but I think. Are you allowed to go back in the states? It was Alberta that I had a problem oh, with. Right, right. Right. The states was always fine. They never. They okay, never you're not it. allowed to just go to Alberta. You so, might be good now. So there's this thing called the statute of limitations. Okay. Anyways, okay, moving, okay, on, anyways moving on. Moving on. Moving on. Like I've been to all except like two provinces. Right. I don't think I've been to Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, but like, I've I've, I've been around. Yep. And you know what? If I could go anywhere in the world, it would be probably to the Kootenays, to the like northern BC. <laughs> right? I like it here. Yeah, you, you guys know I like being outdoors. Hell, I'm wearing camo right now. Yeah, we're I, I want to be out there. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I'm wearing you're a couple of branches off. Like, come on, it's it's. I'm great. wearing math on my shirt. I got the I got the mathematical formula for a natural twenty on my shirt, <laughs> and I'm not even joking. No, no, he's not. But no, seriously, like I, I, I would, I would just, I would go here. I do that every year. I make a trip out to the woods. We go out for like a week at a time. We set up our shelter. We get our wood burning stove. I would like to do that more and for longer. We would like you to do that too. No, 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 you don't. Why not? Because I have an Eberron. Oh yeah. Series I got to finish. As soon as you're done, that you're allowed to go. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. When do I get to go? Uh, as soon as you're done, the Theros one. Fuck. Ah, <laughs> uh, intermission. Intermission. Do do. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. Let me hang out too much. A little bit. Clinky. Uh, that is very hot. No, it isn't. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't you. Oh, yeah. Don't you.